there, this is Tracy Malone from NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. I am here with a special guest, Babita Spinelli. She is a licensed um, therapist and coach, and she's got offices all over the East Coast. So um, today we're going to talk about narcissistic bosses. If you have a narcissistic boss, your life is not easy. It is sort of hellish. They will sabotage you, triangulate you, smear you, and they could ruin your career. So today we're going to talk about the strategies to identify them and the coping strategies if you have to coexist and how to make those choices to set better boundaries and to um, coexist if you have to. So without any further ado, let's welcome Babita. Thank you for joining me. Hi, Tracy. How are you? I'm good. It's so good to see you. I'm so excited about our topic today. Me too. Really excited about it. I know we've talked about a lot of different things, but I think this one is like particularly juicy and has been coming up a lot. You know, I've had the same thing as well. A lot of people, even in my support groups, are coming in going, my boss is a maniac and definitely a narcissist. What do I do? So let's start out by like looking at what are some of the signs that someone would know that they have a narcissistic boss? Sure. Okay. So there are many red flags. And as you and I have talked about, you know, on the narcissist spectrum, we can go to the very extreme, right? The narcissistic abuser to some elements of it. So I'm going to describe, um, you know, a bunch of them that go from one to the other. Um, there's a lot of, as with any narcissist, a lot of grandiosity. So the narcissistic boss or manager will often take up a lot of space they will want to show up in a big way at meetings. They want to be front and center. And even if let's say you've done particular work on something, they will always be the one to showcase it. They are also highly critical. And so oftentimes a person will feel that they're just not good enough um, if it doesn't meet their needs. So one thing about the narcissistic manager is it always has to be about that it's meeting their needs, their results, what's going to make them look good. They will often say, not my problem. So let's say something is coming up for someone with another, let's say, department. It doesn't matter to them. If you're not achieving what they want to accomplish, they will feel very angry. It hurts their ego. We also have situations where you know that there's a narcissistic manager if something is now coming up, creating a narcissistic workplace. For example, a narcissistic manager likes to have people pinned against each other. They like the chaos. They want people to actually almost sab try and sabotage each other or compete because what does it do? It gives them power and control. So what tends to happen is you have narcissistic minions and the minions feed the ego of the narcissistic manager and the other employees are disregarded. They're actually not really um, deferred to for sort of the kinds of roles or projects that they might be seeking. So that also happens when you have a narcissistic boss. Um, I, I have more on the list and I can keep going. Shall I expand? Sure, sure, absolutely, yeah. Because this is just, this the list is just so much here. Um, they will love bomb. Now, this is a concept that we, you know, talk about um, around relationships. Well, a narcissistic manager does it too. What happens is employees find that when they first start or one particular one, let's say, they'll be love bombed. They're like held up to great esteem. They're very excited. They're included in things. But suddenly it turns mm -hmm. and suddenly they might not be the favorite employee because if there's something has happened where they haven't met the need or perhaps there's an opinion that's been asserted where a narcissistic manager doesn't appreciate it, they then end up not being favored. And so the love bombing stops and then it's replaced with the gaslighting. You weren't good enough, it's something you did. Um, this comes up in performance reviews. So the narcissistic manager might have you at exceeds expectations and suddenly you find yourself not meeting expectations and you're like, what happened? A narcissistic manager, and this part is pretty powerful, bleeds boundaries. So now we've seen a little bit of this in the cliche movie, A Devil Wears Prada, where there is the running of personal errands. There's like working all sorts of hours. This does come up in other industries 
for you if you have a narcissistic boss. They might Slack message you all hours. They may expect you to drop everything and do what you're told. They, go, they have you go beyond your role or the kind of work you should be doing. And I'm not talking about someone needs to put out a fire. This is a consistent theme and they will get angry if you don't follow through. Right. And, and it's, it's, if you are doing what they expect, you can, you can stay longer in that love bombing stage. But the minute you question, the minute you go, you know, this might work differently, you're, you're creating that narcissistic wound and they, they turn like it's just that flip where, you know, black and white thinking now you are not the idealized love bombed employee. You are the one that they can't trust. They don't, you know, they want you to just kiss their butt if you would, just sit there and do everything their way. So dare you have an opinion, you risk going into this um, devaluing and um, you know the, the less than expectations puddle, if you would, because you're not playing by their game. It's their game, their rules. So how does somebody deal with this? Like, what's the best way to cope with this? As far as like, I have a, a client that that you know went to HR, and HR um, you would think is there to protect you and help you, but the often HR and the bosses are kind of you know, knitted together. And it's, it's a very difficult environment for her to endure at this point. So how does someone cope with this? Okay, what a great question. And there's so much here for that, on that, because yes, it is very destabilizing, and it really can um, impact someone's, you know, mental well being, etc. So it depends on two things. I'm going to give you two different, several answers on how, you know, how they can cope. The first one is, do they want to stay on the job or not? So this is really critical. So let's look at it first around if they do want to stay at the job. Because for many people, they can't go looking for another job. This is paying the bills. They might even like the work. There may be the work that they actually like, but then they're dealing with the narcissistic manager. So here are some suggestions on coping tools around that. The first one is this, um, when it comes to, let's say around HR, I would say document, 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 document. Mm -hmm. So why is that a coping tool? Because it shows the reality of actually what you're experiencing. So that if, for example, there is something that HR can or cannot do, you've at least had the paper trail to demonstrate what's been happening. And at least it is something that won't impact, let's say your bonus or let's say your performance review, which is very important. So even if HR can't step in or won't step in, you've documented everything. And so you can say, but I've done X, Y, and Z. So that's number one, document, 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 and make sure you print it out because sometimes the server, you know, basically deletes all the, you know, the emails or the notes. The second um, coping tool would be, I would have mentors in the organization so have other people, other department heads, other individuals that you know who can guide you, that know who you are, that know your work, because they will be your support and your backup. When you go to HR, let's say HR doesn't do anything, you at least have established um, a mentor or a guide who's also very senior in the organization. That is so key. Third one is to also have your own individuals or colleagues that back you up in the workspace that you know you work well with. Mm -hmm. And so what that create can help create for you is a bit of a protective bubble so you could still be engaged in the work. Mm -hmm. I also suggest a couple of things that, that are helpful. Two things, emotional distancing and boundaries. So we know that a narcissistic boss is a, is a boundary bleeder. And so what's really important is really to try and cut work off where you can and not to always feel that you have to respond all hours. You could say, I, I circle back, I will get back to you. I'd also suggest your emotional state is so important. So to remember and use emotional intelligence to not get caught up in the dark vortex that could create a lot of depression or anxiety. So keep some distance, limit your interactions where you need to, and make sure that you have outlets for yourself 
talk about the frustration, the anger, the anxiety, and remember like who you are and, and to try and reconnect to yourself to feel empowered because it can be really destabilizing and disempowering to have a narcissistic manager. A um, couple of other pieces that I think are really important is these are nitty gritty techniques and you probably recognize this when you're dealing with like a narcissistic partner or someone you're dating. Um, remember your reality, keep things limited, but also let's say you're in the workplace, you kind of like to play the game. If you're not, if you don't want to leave your job, you're going to have to strategize. So recognize that there are times where pushing a narcissist is not necessarily going to get you anywhere. They'll just get angrier, right? Will be the narcissistic injury. So play the game. If this is a job you want to keep, go in when you need to maybe say things like, I really liked when you did this. How, what do you feel about this? Let them participate. They want their egos fed. You could also do this. Let's say you're working on something that you need to drive results. Give them options, but know that all those options, for example, are one you would choose anyway. So they feel good about it and they love it. They love the fact that you're doing this. So yeah. this is if you want to keep your job because oftentimes people can't leave. And I love what times it's it's such a good job and you've been there for you know twenty five years and in comes this you know new person and and they're trying to steal something. It's very hard to leave a job after you've got that much investment in it and you know retirement and things like that. So the coexisting becomes really important. And you said something about the documenting and and documenting your paper trail of of what you achieved, but I also want to say that we should make sure that people are documenting what the, the the emails chains back and forth and for people to really understand that putting it in writing documenting your anger or your dis you know agreeableness to what they're doing is not a good idea that's showing them your emotions they're actually gaining supply by knowing they got you and so remaining cool when you're doing this kind of communication and you know, keeping, if that's going to be documented and part of the HR file that goes forward about this interaction with your new boss or your boss, um, then you shouldn't be the one losing it in the emails, right? You should be very professional, keeping your cool and um, holding the line to your stability. And then you can show better what they're doing to you and the manipulations that are going on. But there's a lot of manipulations that are so subtle as we know that the covert tactics that they use are sometimes not in those emails. So are there things that people should be doing and not doing in this arena? Mm -hmm. Well, first I wanna say spot on what you just said, like don't lose your emotional cool because then what it becomes, it's about your aggressive behavior than the actual issue and that's the emotional manipulation. So keeping your distance, keeping calm, taking that breath, not feeling like you have to respond right away and not getting caught up in the web of that kind of manipulative you know, engagement. So spot on. So do's and don'ts, I'd say, uh, kind of like capitalizing on piggybacking on what you just said, don't engage, don't feel fire with fire, bringing in the anger, it's not going to get you anywhere. You have to play in the sandbox with this person. So, I would recommend to try and be cooperative. Um, if you don't want to sort of feed their ego by being complimentary, you don't have to, but be neutral and diplomatic. I do not go into a space where you're going to cultivate some sort of rageful environment. It's not going to get you anywhere. The second part is, is be as inclusive as possible. You almost have to show them that you're like that team spirit. You know, this is someone that you know is, doing right by this department and show the team spirit and contribute. I would recommend do make sure that you find your own value and, and ensure that you have relationships with your colleagues, other you know, stakeholders in the company so that they know you, perhaps you wanna do a transfer eventually, but that they know who you are. So that's a big do to make sure you have like your village there um, and especially in these situations where you may not have backup if you're criticized for something by the narcissistic manager. 
The other do is do take care of yourself. Make sure you replenish. This can really impact your, your psyche, your, your, your feeling good enough. So you have to make sure that you recognize what is theirs and what is yours. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's another part of this that often gets interwoven. Um, you, you touched on it at the beginning, but when you have that sort of, you were the idolized one, you came in love bombing, you, you were the star, and all of a sudden you have the fall from grace, if you would. What mm -hmm. often happens then is someone else rises up. And the boss then triangulates you with a coworker and creates this conflict with someone that is on your team. And now it creates, an, even if that person isn't a narcissist, um, they are now sort of the enemy, right? They're, they've taken some of your work. They're sort of, they're, they're, you're being put, they're, you're in the middle of this triangulation circle. How does someone deal with when now it's not just a boss, but now you've got this conflict with another coworker because the boss has created this? How do they cope with that sort of thing? Yes, that is so true. That is so difficult. That's where you have like the narcissistic minions, the ones that are there. They will sabotage you. They will find ways to criticize you. They will try and find ways for people to say that you're doing shoddy work. They will want to take over. They want to be the favored one. So in that triangulation, my recommendations would be this. Um, limit the kinds of interactions you have in the triangle. Um, try to keep, you know, try and maintain the peace. Do your part, do what you need to do, and see if you can consistently just have that relationship with the narcissistic manager in terms of the work that you do. You may not want to play in the sandbox. Do not go back and forth with this person. It is not going to be helpful. So set a boundary. If you don't need to be working on projects with them, meaning you have your work, they have your work, you don't need to overlap, don't. Don't sign up for the same committees they're on. Uh, keep, keep the boundary, keep the distance. Don't engage in an email exchange with that person. Um, I would recommend that if they're going down a particular path, I would try and like stop it right there, maybe even defer to the manager to just say, you know, could you, um, would love your opinion on how we should do this. Now you may not get the answer you want. Yeah, put that in writing so that you've got the evidence to HR to say, I've gone to my manager this day, this day, this day. Um, because the, the verbal conversations are, are dangerous in, in an environment like this because yes. they can get twisted, they can deny them. So, you know, writing and documentation as we started is your, you know, your, your golden wand here because this is the tool that is going to show that you have asked for help, that this was their answer and this is the outcome and it's still going on. Now you've got, again, that documented flow of what's going on. So whatever communications you're doing with the other person or with your boss about this, always, always document in writing and, and get that feedback. And um, if they do, you, you send your boss an email and you say, this is what's going on. And then they turn around and come into your cube or your office and discuss it with you. Send a recap, send them a recap and say, hey, boss, this is what I just want to recap. So you're saying blah, blah, blah. Again, in writing, and take it out of that conversation in the cubicle because that is where the danger lies and the gray areas that they can lie and exploit and um, get you in more trouble because there is no follow-up. So make sure yeah. you do that. Everything in writing, everything in writing. And in fact, what's, what, where it really also gets quite detrimental is when you, are, you, you yourself are a C-suite executive or you yourself are a partner in a, in a firm or a company, and you have someone that you report into, let's say who's another head partner, et cetera, and they are a narcissist and they want, they fire you, they wanna fire you. Mm -hmm. This becomes really challenging for that executive because what happens is it can get very ugly. They find that they're um, in a situation where they have to end up defending themselves to also negotiate their severance to negotiate, right? They're being let go. And I'm not talking about a sweeping layoff where you know that you've basically been thrown under the bus. 
that this person doesn't need you anymore, mm-hmm. or that maybe you're going down another path and they don't agree with your vision. In those situations for those executives, that documentation is so critical because often they need to get an attorney involved. They need to get an employment lawyer involved because maybe they don't have HR actually even at that stage, right? HR is not going to back them up at all. So the attorney is going to want to see those emails, going to want to see the documentation. They're going to want to see that this particular executive performed because a lot of times what's said is, they weren't performing to the optimal level of their role. So Mm -hmm. it really does get tricky. So I would agree that documentation and snapshotting and circling back with an email is very significant. And if you can even limit those cubicle drop-ins by redirecting, I actually have a meeting right now. I have a call. Could you drop me an email? Yeah, that's a good one too. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Because this, this, this does get tricky Now, the other part is if you're in a position where maybe you can leave or you should say, this is too much, like to really think about the pros and cons of this situation of hanging in in this role to say, might it be better for me to really think about another environment because this is not normal? Can I really tolerate this for years and years? And that's easier to do early on in your career than perhaps the 25 year mark where you're like, okay, you know, I want to end up, you know, my, you know, finally leaving and exiting out in another few years. Mm -hmm. Early on in your career to really think about, do I want to continue like this? Mm -hmm. Is this good for my career? Am I going to get to where I want to be by staying in this organization with a narcissistic manager? Or even a narcissistic, you know, the whole corporation structure could be, it's not just that person. So you have no other resources. If, if it's just sort of a toxic place and it's a boys club or, you know, just that, that concept where they're all going to stick together, lie together. And, and, you know, if you become the one that's on the out, then you are the dangerous one that they can't let get the next level. They're not going to let you get to the next, you know, management level or the, the, you know, your normal progression in the company. So um, that's where evaluation has to come into the picture and look at your options. And again, if you can change departments, if that head is, is a little bit nicer, but if it's a toxic mm-hmm. environment all around, your emotional like stability and resilience is, is going to be shot. And who wants 25 years of that? So can someone really heal if they've been in this situation? Is there like a healing? I know time heals the, you know, relationship narcissistic wounds, but mm-hmm. how does someone build up their, their self-esteem after this sort of thing? Because they're telling you you're not doing it right, that you're not good enough and things like that. And then now you've got to go out and, and pimp yourself to get a new job and you're, you're smaller than you were. They've deflated your, your ego a little bit to know and have the confidence that you can do another job. How does someone heal from all this? Yes, it really is quite awful. It really is quite awful to one's self-esteem. When you're looking again, it's awful. I, I compare it to or allude it to trauma. So there can really be these PTSD symptoms around what they experienced. So in the work, there's several ways in terms of healing. One, if there's um, extreme trauma where literally the anxiety, the depression around what took place is so strong, I'd say, you know, you can heal from consistent, you know, therapy, um, which can really be helpful around as if it's trauma therapy and really working through what happened talking about it, recognizing that this was a narcissistic situation, either narcissistic magic corporation, um, and starting to look at how you can rebuild your self-esteem and your self-compassion to yourself, recognizing that this is very wounding. You can also join support groups, um, individuals who've also, and, and you well know this, Tracy, running yours, who are also aware and have experienced the same thing and they have someone to guide them to facilitate saying this is a shared experience and this exists and that can be very healing they're able to process and talk about what happened Um, i would also recommend doing a lot of work around who you are and re 
building yourself and re-identifying who you were prior to this situation. So go back to that empowered man or woman who actually can remember the times where they did really good, solid work or personally where they have felt like they were leaders or leaned in. I'd suggest while you're looking for a job, maybe volunteer for organizations, see your value in things. Do those things that you know that you offer something of value and re remember that that those are the qualities you have. So there's a lot of, I would call it like almost replacing the negative cognitions with the positive cognitions and experiences. Yeah, it's, it's knowing your truth. You know, we, be, we, we, we tend to get to a place where they've beaten down your ego and, and your strength and your power. Um, and we have to get back to knowing that your skills are what they really are. And, and you've been doing this for however long you've been doing it. And, um, and just believe in yourself again, because that's the, the self-love piece that, that's part of um, healing for any of this. Um, setting those boundaries is gonna give you more strength, right? It might not give you the same results as you think that you should get, because setting a an, an boundary with a narcissist may or may not work. But if you stop trying to set a boundary, then they win, right? It's, it's still, you know, holding yourself to that. I'm going to request this. And again, to get it in writing, I'm going to request that this be how we handle this or, you know, just protect yourself and know that inside of you that this is not you, it is them. And that shouldn't take away from the strength and the power of what you learned to do that job for all these years. Yes, exactly. And just to like piggyback on what you said, so true, because um, one of the things to help heal is remembering who you were, maybe even reaching out to former individuals you worked with, who can also remind you of who you were, remembering and go back to that space, that I do offer something of value. These are my skills. It's just this particular situation. The other part is this, is all of our lessons learned. So it takes a lot of resilience to even tolerate and deal with a narcissistic environment in the workplace. So almost cheer yourself on to say, wow, you know what? I showed some resilience there. Look at what I dealt with and lean into that and even remember, okay, here are the red flags. I'm now going to choose more intentionally the kind of corporate culture, who are the kind of person I wanna work for in my future. So I'm gonna take this experience, which was rather traumatizing, which was destabilizing, which affected my self-esteem, and I am going to channel that by my lessons learned. And boom, when I'm in an interview, when I'm seeing something, I'm gonna ask the right questions and get a sense, is this an environment I wanna be in? And it's just gonna lead you to someplace where you're going to be valued and you're going to feel good about where you are. Yeah, that's a really good piece of advice because, you know, if you do have to leave, you have to look at the culture the next time. You have to look a little bit deeper so that you don't get into the same trap. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Do you have any yeah. things to add that, that will help people? You know, I would say be gentle with yourself. The first thing is, if you just even notice things, perhaps get educated. Like, is this, is this possibly a narcissistic toxic situation? Because once that first awareness or education piece is there, so anyone who's listening to this is now more aware and educated, right? Then you're able to formulate how you cope with it and what you need to do. You right. can then strategize, you know your do's and don'ts. You know the way you need to cope. You recognize you have to replenish your cup. You know you have to set boundaries. So the first thing is if you start to suspect something, mm -hmm. start to like educate yourself and you may be in a situation where you're, you are with a narcissistic corporate environment or manager or you know uh, colleagues who are sort of building that up in terms of the narcissistic space. And then plan accordingly. And it is okay to get help and support. Mm -hmm. Reach out. This is not an anomaly. This is happening. And in fact, you may have experienced this, Tracy, in the pandemic. This is coming up even in remote work. This is coming up where it's bleeding into the personal space, yeah. right? So I would really recommend like 
not to discount or feel that this is really happening. It probably is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and again, the, the, the new work from home concept for corporations leaves us with a lot of Zoom meetings like this. And so when a boss um, is inappropriate on a call in front of others, um, use that as you know proof and evidence and and to, to your hr department hey you know this call them out on it don't don't just let them you know get away with you know belittling you for no reason because now you're, they're doing it in front of everyone instead of in your queue so um the rules are a little bit different now and someone might watch this video in three years and there won't be COVID lockdown and people will, you know, be past this all, but it's, it's a reality right now. It is something that is happening and um, workers are, are looking for help and guidance. So I'm really grateful that you came and talked to us today. You're a wealth of information and I love having you on the show. So thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, Tracy. I love being on your show. It's always, we always have such meaningful, enriching dialogue that, that I hope is and helpful to everybody. So thank you so much. And I look forward to us connecting again, you know, in the future. Great. Thanks. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you learned something from Babita and our conversation today. The most important part is document, 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 and protect yourself because, um, Things are going to be pulled on you, and if you have some evidence, then you will be able to defend yourself and protect yourself. Um, if you are someone with a narcissistic boss or even a coworker, you can visit my website, NarcissistAbuseSupport.com, where I actually have a free ebook for you on dealing and identifying a narcissistic co-worker or boss. So um, this is the website. If you are interested in coaching, if you've got this sort of issue and you just don't know what to do, you can also from my website um, find out more about coaching with me or go to Babita's website. I'll put the link below and you can tap into her. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today and we will see you soon.